morning. Um, it's really good to be here, and thanks to Coloplast for putting on this amazing event and for, for having Julie and I uh, speak to you this morning. Um, we're going to talk about ways of promoting and supporting uh, treatment adherence. Our aims and objectives for this morning are to highlight some of the psychological factors that may influence adherence, to discuss ways that you might maximize the chances that someone's adherent right from the start, so right from the first time that you start to discuss uh, different treatments or maybe the first time that you meet with someone. We're going to introduce ways of working with patients who start to struggle with adherence later down the line. Perhaps they've started out and everything's been going okay, but somehow they've They've fallen away from uh, being adherent. And then we're going to use uh, a case example from Julie's practice to highlight some of this stuff, really. Now, one of the things that Philip talked about yesterday, particularly in the earlier phases following diagnosis of a, a long-term health condition, perhaps a neurological condition, there are all sorts of things to adjust to all sorts of things to get your head around. New things that we didn't think that we would have to deal with or think about before suddenly are on our radar. We're having to think and worry about this stuff. And so there are a number of things, everyday things, particularly at the early stages following diagnosis or, um, or injury that we're suddenly having to be uh, thinking about that can and will get the threat system going. Just everyday things that people have to think about that are part of managing their condition or the part of people helping uh, them to treat their condition could be seen as uh, by the, or interpreted by that person as being threatening. And the whole stuff again about how do I fit in socially? I've had this injury, things have changed for me. Do I fit in? How am I going to contribute? But also some of the factors relating to, we recommend treatments to people with all good intention because we believe that they are the right treatments for that person. But that does not mean to say that that person won't find elements to or things about that treatment potentially threatening. And as Desiree said this morning, if people feel threatened, if they're anxious, it makes it far, far less likely that they're going to take on board what we're saying and far, far less likely that they're going to be adherent to these treatments. So there's a few things that I'd like you to hold in mind as we talk about adherence. So one of these things is that we've inherited, and it's a good job that we have, this threat-focused mind from our ancestors. We can't help that. That's not our fault. It's old programming, if you like. But it's still there. It's still seen as relevant uh, today. Our brain remains oriented, uh, oriented towards threat today. And our threat system affects us from a physiological, a cognitive, an emotional, and a behavioral uh, point of view. And there are lots of potential challenges for people with neurological conditions that may activate that threat system. So I'm going to move on to treatment adherence now. So treatment adherence is the behavior. And what we're talking about is whether someone is taking action in line with the things that we have recommended that we say for good reason, will help them to manage their condition. And adherence is really, really important. If we are recommending that someone use a particular treatment, it's because we believe it will help them. If people are adherent to that treatment, then there's a high likelihood that the treatment won't work. It will fail in some way, shape, or form, which will increase the risk of morbidity and increase the risk of mortality. So adherence is really, really important. And when we're talking about adherence, we're talking about the right treatment for that person in the right amount, the right time, and in the right way. And when we're talking about procedural type treatments, the right way can be a really important factor. And if people are able to be using the treatments that we recommend in the right amount and the right way, then hopefully they're going to reap the rewards of the treatments that we're recommending. So the things Thinking about transanal irrigation, the things that we hope that people will um, benefit from, if that is the right treatment for them, are an avoidance of fecal incontinence, um, avoiding things like constipation, being able to get into a regular and workable bowel regime that doesn't take over their entire life, so that they can achieve comfort and safety, dignity, autonomy, and then the so psychosocial factors that are so important around them being able to participate from a social point of view and be able to maximize their independence. 
there are a number of things that affect adherence. So one of those things is whether people feel supported. Do they have a team around them from their family's point of view, from the point of view of the, the people looking after them um, within uh, the medical practice? Do they have the support around them to use uh, that treatment? Do they have access to that treatment? Can they access it in a readily timely fashion? Is it affordable? Do they know how to use it? Do they have the necessary information in order to be able to make use of that treatment? And then there's a balance of beliefs as well. Does that person believe that they need that treatment? Is it seen as being an important element of their treatment, of their, of their uh, condition management? But also, are they, overly, are they concerned about the potential adverse effects? Most treatments, if not all treatments, have potential side effects. But is someone uh, overly concerned or are they over concerned about the, the, the likelihood um, that this treatment is going to lead to negative consequences? If someone's in threat, if someone's in that threat mode, if they're worried, if they're concerned about the treatment, again, they're going to struggle. And also, do they feel confident to make use of this treatment? So we're going to talk to you about laying good foundations for adherence. So th these are things that we feel are important right from the start, right from the very first consultation, laying good foundations to make it much more likely that someone's going to be on board with us and is going to be adherent to treatments. Thanks, Nigel. So um, assessment is so, so important when you're seeing a patient for irrigation. And I think it could be useful to consider using a checklist. Although you know all the questions as a medical person, what to ask the patient potentially, it's setting up a good standard of care. It's showing the patient that you're invested in them and that you are caring about the details of their problem. So by having a checklist, it keeps you focused. The patient can see that. Time is of the element here when you've got a clinic full of patients to see. I think it's quite clinical. It's not pitying. I don't like pity. They like to see somebody, patients, that's going to take a clinical approach to their care and get things covered. I'm hoping it perhaps reduces some of the embarrassment because you're asking from a checklist. So those questions you're asking are therefore okay. It's okay for the patient to tell you that they've got this symptom or they're putting a finger in their bottom, etc. Detail, care, and showing that you're gonna get things right for them. So we know about the neurological bowel disease questionnaire and that's a really great tool but it's not enough when you see your patient in clinic. You need to do a really detailed assessment and you need to ask them all the questions that they may never ever have been asked before about their bowel symptoms. You are the first person that has ever covered every bit of detail about their bowels. And by doing that, again, it shows you're gonna give good care, but also this is crucial because if you want patients to adhere to transanal irrigation, you need to follow them up. And you're going to be able to use this assessment tool when you follow them up to give them really detailed follow-up advice. Good information. Keep it basic. It's completely overwhelming when patients first see this kit. So demonstrate the equipment in a really simple way. And remember, set realistic expectations. Peristine is great, as are other irrigation kits, but it's not going to cure depression for the patient. It's not going to take all their pain away. It's not going to decorate their house for them. So you have to remember to tell them that this will be a two or three month process of you looking after them, troubleshooting, so that we get to the right pathway and it will work well for them. Simple, simple, simple. Don't bombard patients with information at that first appointment. Chunk what you need to tell them. And then you add to that in the follow-up. So this is the kind of advice I might give to my patients when they come and see me before they go home. And we know this from the field of addiction too. So motivational interviewing is a... For the, 
a number of you will have heard a motivational interview and maybe use it in your practice. And there's no way that I can do justice to motivational interview in the next five minutes. Um, we could have a whole conference about motivational interviewing. But it was developed as a, an antidote, if you like, an alternative to persuasion techniques within the field of addiction. And it's been rolled out to be used in healthcare. Um, and there's some really good books that will guide you uh, in making use of motivational interviewing. So motivational interviewing is a, a way of being with people rather than a particular type of therapy. And it's built upon the assumption that whether someone is motivated to make a change or not depends highly on what we say to people and how we say it. And that confronting people only tends to make them more stubborn. And it's based on a number of skills. These are skills that you will already have in your toolkit. The things that we already, you will already know about. And it's ways of being with people in the room. So the core skills around using open questions to open up conversations with people, to get conversations going. If someone started to struggle with their treatment and they're not being adherent anymore, they're probably going to feel it, they're going to be feeling uh, probably negatively about their use of that treatment, but they might be having uh, negative thinking about their management of their condition as a whole. And so if we can use affirmations to point out the things that they are doing well, it can help increase their confidence. If people feel more confident, it reduces anxiety. If people feel less anxious, then they're more flexible. We can use reflections to let people know that, we, that we've heard them, that we get what they're saying, that we're on board, that we're together. It's a way of demonstrating that I've heard what you've said here. And we can use summaries, again, to reflect back larger chunks of conversation, larger chunks of bits of what people have said to us in clinic. But maybe use summaries in a, um, in a skilled way to highlight certain parts of the conversation that might link to change. And we need to be creating conditions where the patient themselves are telling us that they need to change. So I recognize I've, I'm struggling with this, um, with transalien irrigation right now, but I, I, need to, I do need to get back on board with it, rather than us having to do the hard sell and try and convince. Using open questions, active, reflective listening, and trying to create discrepancy. And when thinking about change, it's dependent upon readiness. So people need to feel ready to make a change. And that's dependent on two factors. The importance that they feel, you know, having an, uh, the sense of importance that it is to make this change and also their confidence to make a change. We can use a tool such as uh, scaling questions in order to assess this. So just a blank piece of A4 paper, a visual analog scale. How important would you rate getting back on track with your bowel regime right now? And just asking them to plot it on that line. Give it a number. Great. So tell me what makes it so important to you and having that conversation. Is eight high enough to make a change? Do you feel like eight is enough for you to be making a change with this right now? If the patient's rating the importance as much lower, as Julie said, they're probably not on board with making this change. If they're not on board with making this change, it's kind of a non-starter, really. And so we wouldn't recommend pushing any further. But if they are rating it as being important, then perhaps starting to think about using scaling questions to assess the confidence that person has to make this change. So how confident do you feel making this change right now? If they rate it as a five, what makes it a five and not a four? So what are the things that stack up underneath that that are making it a five rather than lower? So focusing on the positive. What would your confidence rating need to be in order for you to consider making a change with this right now? Well, it'd kind of be an eight. So what would it take for me to work with you, to get you from where you are now, which is a five, maybe to a six. What would we have to put in place to increase your confidence from a five to a six? And working alongside to incrementally increase someone's confidence to make that change. We have a threat-focused mind. And it's, it can be and is activated by complications or management of neurological conditions. We need to have the patient on board with us in order to make a change. And the relationship is key in order to help them to do that. If adherence becomes a struggle later down the line, we need to roll with that. We need to express empathy, acknowledge that this is a struggle, but be around to help them uh, when they are ready to make a change. And we need to remember that ambivalence is normal. Thank you.